Hey guys, this is Zachary from Adkins Guitar and Music Lessons. In this video, we're going to be going over probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest, thrash metal albums of all time, Rust in Peace by Megadeth. Before we do that, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up, and also click that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any more of my videos. So enough with the intro, let's talk about the 10 interesting facts about Megadeth's Rust in Peace. Before Rust in Peace came out, Megadeth had already been around for about eight years. We all know that Dave Mustaine was the guitar player for Metallica. He got kicked out of Metallica for drinking too much. He decided to fight back by creating the band Megadeth. And they actually ended up putting out a few albums before this. The first album that Megadeth came out with was Killing Is My Business and Business Is Good. The second album that they came out with was Peace Sells, But Who's Buying? And the album right before Rust in Peace was so far, so good, so what? These albums launching the way, it was now time for what has been called their greatest album of all time, Rust in Peace. Number nine, Album Reception. As I stated before, this album's been rated as one of the greatest metal albums of all time. In my opinion, it's probably the greatest metal album of all time. The riffs and the solos and the harmonies and the drum tone and just everything about this album is just amazing. As far as Megadeth, it's my favorite album from Megadeth. And from metal in general, it's got to be in number one spot or number two spot. The album was also received really well from critics. What I want to do now is I want to read you what some of the critics and what some of these magazines and articles had to say about the album. Robert Palmer of Rolling Stones wrote that the album is a demonstration of how far the nasty speed thrash concept can go without being formulaic and boring. Entertainment Weekly, Jim Farber, described the music as sheer velocity combined with dexterity, and Mustang's lyrics were nihilistically whimsy. Mike Stagno, with Sputnik Music, agreed that the songwriting was top-notch on the album, as well as the fast and technical musicianship. He also spoke highly of Friedman and Mustang's guitar performance, calling them one of the most potent duos in the scene. Number eight, Marty Friedman and Nick Menza's first album. Chuck Baylor was the drummer on the album, So Far, So Good, So What. Chuck was actually Gar Samuelson's drum tech before this. He got the gig when Gar could no longer perform. However, in a twist of irony, Chuck also developed a drug addiction, mostly cocaine, and was then replaced by his drum tech, Nick Menza. Jeff Young was also the guitar player for So Far, So Good, So What. He was needed to be replaced but this would be a little bit trickier. There were multiple guitar players that came in and wanted to audition to try to be in the band. Dimebag Daryl, Jeff Loomis, and Jeff Waters. Jeff Loomis was told that he was too young to be in the band. However, Dave Mustaine had heard a lot about this new upcoming guitar player, Marty Friedman. Had heard a lot about him in the scene, had actually even gotten an album of Marty Friedman. But it wasn't that easy. Number seven, Dave Mustaine was not initially impressed by Marty Friedman. We all know now that Marty Friedman is the powerhouse guitar player that he is. But back then, he was still just an upcoming guitar player. He was actually in a band with Jason Becker called Cacophony. They had released a few albums and played a bunch of gigs. But then Marty Friedman decided to put out his own solo album called Dragon's Kiss. Dave Mustaine had a copy of Dragon's Kiss in the studio. However, he saw Marty Friedman's hair and the cheesy album cover and just threw the album to the side and never really cared about it. He actually went so far as to call Marty Friedman a clown. This is what Dave Mustaine had to say about it. A couple of months would go by and I'd look at it and throw it down again. But eventually I listened to it because my manager was relentless about this guy. So I heard it and thought, wow, he wants to play with us? Marty was then added to the roster and they never looked back. Number six, bumper sticker inspiration. While driving in Lake Elsinore in California, Dave Mustaine came across a bumper sticker that read, May all your nuclear weapons rust in peace. Dave was always on the lookout for new inspiration for music and lyrics and concepts. He wrote down this phrase and it just stuck with him. This ended up becoming the concept of the Rust in Peace album in general. It's pretty amazing to think that something like a bumper sticker is only about this big would cause such a ripple effect of ideas and all of these songs to start coming to fruition. So make sure that when you're out driving around, you're always looking for inspiration for your music. 
because you never know what's going to actually inspire you and, and cause a ripple effect like this. Number five, album cover. Dave Mustaine brought in artist Ed Repka to bring this album to life. He had the concept, he had the bumper sticker idea, and now he had all of these ideas running through his head about what he wanted the album to be like. He didn't necessarily want a concept album like where every song would lead into the next, but the idea of the album in general is something that he wanted to have at least a theme. Repka has before and since been associated with hundreds of musical artists. Municipal Waste, Austrian Death Machine, Death, and he even modeled designs for the Hellraiser franchise. This album is so iconic. The bright blue just pops. And you see Vic Rattlehead on the cover with some sort of alien life form. Behind the scenes of there, you see some world politicians and, and uh, some really known faces at the time. So it kind of almost seems like there's some kind of government conspiracy through uh, UFOs and alien connections. So it's, it's actually pretty creepy. Number four, platinum sales. When this album got released, it debuted at number 23 in the Billboard Top 200. This is pretty great for a metal album. With the success of this album, it's no surprise that it would go and sell so many copies. When an album sells 500,000 copies, it gets a gold certification. When it sells a million copies like Rust in Peace did, it ends up getting a platinum certification. Anytime an album can go platinum, you can look back on that album and know that, that they did something right and that fans really loved this one. And I think that this album deserves all the praise that it gets. And I think it should have sold 10 million copies. Number three, Metallica Connection, Hangar 18. So as I stated before, we all know that Dave Mustaine was in Metallica. And there has been some dispute on whether or not Dave's riffs were kept by Metallica or if Metallica riffs were kept by Dave and how much of certain albums that Dave Mustaine had an association with with his riffs and ideas and how much was stolen between the two. There's this big, big conspiracy about it all. And we don't really know what's true and what's false. And I think that I could probably go into an entire video about seeing songs and riffs that are really similar and what Dave Mustaine has to say about it, but that, that's a whole other video. However, if you listen to the song Hangar 18, you'll notice that uh, the riff at the beginning of the song where it starts at a D minor and then ascends up the neck, there's actually a Metallica song that sounds really similar to this. If you listen to the song Call of Cthulhu, you will hear the similarities between the two riffs. I can't play them in this video because I'll probably get demonetized, but definitely check those two songs out and you tell me if you can hear the same riff going on. Number two, Nick Menza's Alien Obsession. So Hangar 18 actually kind of caused a little bit of a drift between Dave Mustaine and Nick Menza. Apparently Nick was really into UFOs and aliens and all the conspiracy theories that go behind it. It actually was so bad that it started to freak some of the members of the band out a little bit. This is what Dave Mustaine had to say about it. I wrote the song and I called it N2RHQ. It was like the numbers on the side of a plane. It was a future tech thing. It was kind of sci-fi where I would go someplace in the future into space. Not that I even really saw an alien. Menza is the guy who believes in UFOs. If you look at his website, or if you listen to his solo music, it shows you where he's at in his life. Nick said something that I found really juvenile and offensive. He told me that Jesus was an alien and he could levitate. That was the end of me taking Nick seriously. I believed in God ever since I was a kid. I do think that there are UFOs and I think there's plenty of evidence that it's real, but at what point does it become an obsession and then just kind of something that you're interested in? And I think that Nick Menza kind of towed the line a little bit with Dave and hopefully that didn't really, you know, jar their friendship too much, but the album still had really great success and that they were still able to tour together. So it must not have been too terrible. Number one, Irish Conflict. I want to make sure that I get this right, so I'm going to read the quote here. The highly charged political and religious Holy Wars lyrics are popularly thought to address the troubles of Northern Ireland, an age-old conflict between Catholic locals in the Irish Republican Army and England-backed Protestant armed forces. There's no way I could have remembered all of that, so I'm glad that I just read it. So Dave Mustaine saw some bootleg copies of Megadeth shirts being sold at some of the shows. He really wanted to try to stop this, but they told him that he really shouldn't even get involved. And he got kind of upset because 
that's how they make their money. And he would say, hey, this is how I make money on the road. We've made some album sales, but we sell merch. We sell these things and that helps support the band. They told Dave that he wasn't allowed to really go and stop them because they were selling the shirts for the cause. Dave didn't really know what the cause was. They later told Dave that it was actually the Irish Republican army that was the cause. He said, well, the Catholics are against the Protestants and the Protestants are against the Catholics. Dave Mustaine said, to me, any religion that thinks it's better than another religion is full of it. Later, Dave Mustaine found out a little bit more and this is what he had to say. I found out that the IRA wasn't as apparently opposed to the English as I was told. Yet the way that it was described to me was very watered down. I shot my mouth off while I was there saying, this one is for the cause, anarchy in Ireland. Give Ireland back to the Irish. I caught a lot of flack from the English press and I caught a lot from the Irish. Dave Mustaine really didn't understand what he had just done. He pissed off a lot of people. And then he also dedicated the song Anarchy in the UK to the cause. The crowds rioted and Dave Mustaine and Megadeth, they all had to be escorted out and they had to travel in a bulletproof van just to get safely away from the whole situation. I think this is something that Dave has really regretted. And I know that Elfson was really pissed and had to like have a heart to heart with Dave about it and say, look, man, that was not cool. You can't just do stuff like that because now our lives are in danger. I really can't imagine how stressful that whole situation would have been. But also once you start getting religion and uh, politics intertwined with each other and you're a musical act who's a guest in somebody else's country, I can see that uh, maybe you want to be a little bit smarter about those choices. So luckily they made it out okay, but I can't really imagine how stressful that was. All right, guys, that was my look into the top 10 interesting facts about Megadeth's Rust in Peace. If you have any more facts or there's anything that I missed, leave them in the comment section below. Also, tell me a little bit about some of your favorite things that have happened to you while listening to this album or how it's inspired you as a musician or if you're just a huge fan of Megadeth, I really want to hear the stories. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up and also subscribe to the channel for more videos. Up next, there's a bunch of videos about top 10 interesting facts about some of your favorite albums. Make sure you check those out and I'll see you guys in the next video.